Um, I think like a lot of people, so I graduated university here in, in, the, in the U.S. and uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So uh, what did I do? I, I started going to grad school. I started going to NYU in uh, New York, which is where I'm from originally. And uh, as part of going into grad school, I was like, hey, you know, I, I need to like make some money on the side. Uh, so I went on to Craigslist. Uh, to look for internships. I ended up finding an internship for an online gaming company. I was like, okay, well, gaming sounds fun. I like games. Uh, and I had, it, it was a technology company and I like technology. So I started uh, working for this company part-time, $10 an hour. Um, and uh, the company happened to be run by uh, now my my co-founder and the founders, Tuta De Aresi. And I, I ended up dropping out of NYU a year later. Uh, I, honestly, it was right time, right place for me. I, I mm -hmm. jumped into a company where, you know, I'm a marketer and I jumped into a fast growing startup that was about to raise funding and uh, and they needed a marketer, right? And I think that's the beauty of startups where, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like, hey, we have all of these different things that need to get done. And I was like, yeah, okay, well, I can try to do it. I don't know how, but, you know, give me give me a couple hours. I'll go online, do some research, and I'll figure it out, right? And uh, and that that was what always endeared me to startups. So then eventually that company, you know, I was the first marketer. Uh, we ended up selling that company for $18 million a couple of years later, and I, I ran all the marketing. And then I started working for a large company, mm -hmm. uh, Real mm -hmm. Networks. I'm sure I'll, I'll, everyone remembers. Well, I don't know everybody. Now I'm dating myself, but real networks. Um, <laughs> so I started working for a large company, and then I realized, so I kind of went the opposite route, right? A lot of people go from large company to startup. I went from mm -hmm. startup to large company, and I was like, okay, this is not for me. Uh, so, and and I've just, I've been part of, uh, part of the startup realm ever since. But a very interesting point. So uh, you, you talked about, I come from the background, I've worked in corporate and management consulting and got bored and came to the startup side. So complete yeah. opposite. What, yeah. uh, what did you find different or more interesting in startups, which was not there in corporate side? How are the two things different? Startups, uh, at least they should be. I'm not saying they always are, right? But uh, okay. a good startup or the right startup is democratic. Okay. Right. It doesn't matter what degree you have or who you play golf with on Sundays or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like I was this 21 year old. Right. And, and, and the company was like, OK, well, hey, we, we need somebody to market. Oh, you want to do it? Sure. OK, go do it. You know, and, and that was that was the thing that always that always attracted me to it was just that you can get things done really, really quickly. And it just provided a lot more opportunity to anybody that had ambition and or just could like learn and figure stuff out really really quickly right okay. this is something it's, it's the uh fso people figure mm. shit out figure s out people okay <laughs> right okay. um whereas then when i started working for a large business and i was only there for about a year um mm -hmm. but uh then i realized okay it's not it's not so much now about what i can do and the performance it's also about the politics and the you know <laughs> okay got all it of, all of those games of thrones and and, and that so, to me just didn't seem like a very good use of time <laughs> so democracy gone in the politics side so okay yeah. so so great that you mentioned uh, uh, about democracy or democratic control in a startup irrespective of what you have and then the initiative or the freedom to contribute and match it with your ambition so, so that's a very, a very good observation. Does democracy come under threat when investors walk in? Like, because startup is always a building journey. What happens as the yeah. journey develops? You think it stays that way? So that that's a good uh, that's a good segue into what what the next steps were in that online. So it was an online gaming company. It was called Game mm -hmm. Trust. Okay. okay. Uh, and this was a company, you know, I joined it in 2004, the company was sold in 2006. So mm -hmm. if you look at that, that point in time, we were building an online gaming platform that allowed people to compete with each other, to earn points, you know, all these things are called gamification at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was all before like Facebook, uh, launched their online gaming platform. Um, so back then it was called uh, casual games and then it became social games. But anyway, um, Yes, we 
took investment, a lot of investment at the time, $18 million. I don't know. Like the, it's, <laughs> if you were to compare what it, what $18 yeah. million dollars in funding was back in 2005, 2006, that would have been the equivalent of like a hundred million dollars of funding today. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and we were not, we were not treated well by an, our investors. Okay. Um, like not at all. And mm -hmm. look, I guess I kind of get it. It was, this was New York city. So New York, in general, um, you know, investors are going to have a different culture depending on what city the investors are in. New York investors mm -hmm. are, all, are always going to be more about, you know, they're financial engineers, right? Looking um, from things from a purely financial perspective, which they should, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas like Silicon Valley investors, some other or, or investors in some other cities might be looking at more from, hey, that this is, you know, where it's kind of blue ocean type strategies, like mm -hmm. what's this needs time. So, and also back then, a lot of the investors were still reeling from the billions of dollars they lost around the 2000 um, dot bomb, right? So all of the chips, so to speak, using a poker analogy, were in favor of the investors. So the investors were able to really push forward a lot of non-favorable terms and, uh, and act in non-favorable ways to founders because that was the market. Okay. Right? Um, like we had investors throw a clipboard at us in a meeting, for example, mm, mm. like at our face. Right. Um, so it was a different time back then. Uh, and yes, so I think and that and that's a big thing as, as to one of the reasons why Founders Institute was created. And this isn't like a founder versus investor kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it's just a lot of founders don't understand that, you know, not every business needs investors. And depending on the kind of business that you want to run, you may not want investors because when you, you bring on investors, that's, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're getting on a rocket ship, right? And that rocket ship's either going to go get to the moon or it's going to go like this, mm -hmm. right? And not everybody wants to get on a rocket ship and that's totally fine. Right. But that's just a decision that you need to make. And I think a lot of people just don't, you know, investors are there, like they have to make money. They, they report to LPs, right? And a, 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 an investor, generally speaking, um, especially a VC, an institutional investor, they are in the business of raising money from other people that have billions, right? Um, that don't have the time to invest little, little pieces of money, like a couple hundred thousand, a couple million dollars. They act as a middleman to then distribute that money and they need to provide returns to those people that have the billions, mm -hmm. right? So that that's just, I, I think this is, um, you know, it's just the dichotomy that, that a lot of people don't understand very well. Um, the good thing about early stage startups is that angels, generally speaking, are, are going to play a much more active role because they don't have LPs and people with mm -hmm. billions to report to. Okay, that's a very good point. We already ran a little forward with our discussion because we are still in, in how uh, you became interested in entrepreneurship, but it's really great because uh, what you are mentioning here is that not every business needs investor. That's a great point and that's a, that should sink in. So community that's listening in, I think that's a great point to take with you because there's a lot of struggle in startup community and startups are always struggling with the time. Focus is a ma major thing. And in the time focus, if you are focusing, splitting it between investors versus customers, where should they be focusing on? Like, well, I think it goes by stage, right? And this yeah. is where uh, one of the things we do in Founder Institute, mm -hmm. we we really qualify, and we have a, a program for all of our alumni called uh, mm -hmm. Funding mm -hmm. Lab. We really qualify to people. If you're going to raise funding, it's going to take the CEO of the company twenty to twenty-five hours a week. Okay. Right. Um, and there's no skirting around that. There, there really is not. OK, now, okay, obviously, there's there's edge cases. Maybe you just have some incredibly rich friends or something. OK, mm -hmm. maybe it's easier mm -hmm. for you. Um, but generally speaking, it's going to take about 20 to 25 hours a week. And you're probably going to have to pitch um, over 100 people. And you're going to get like 90 no's. Right. And. I'm not the first person who said that hundred people, 90 knows kind of thing, but just let that sink in. I mean, that is a, mm -hmm. that is, I've been through it. It is a morally 
just, I mean, God, it's just, <laughs> it's awful. It, it's like you have this dream, right? And you're spending all of your days and energy trying to bring this dream together and you're recruiting people for this dream. And these people are just telling you, no, 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 no. Or even worse, actually, they're not telling you, no, they're just stringing you along because they're being mm -hmm. nice, right? But but all the while it's no, right? And, and that is... <laughs> It's it's a very emotionally draining experience, and uh, yeah, I think I think this is where really you have to if if you can't devote that amount of time to raising funding, then you have to figure out another another way to do it. But also, I think it goes deeper into the, your vision for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't see the company exiting for tens of millions, if not hundreds or billions of dollars, yeah, then you probably don't want to raise, you know, traditional, traditional funding. Okay, got it. But this is really great to have two reflective uh, statistics coming from you, like 190 no's, let that sink in, and 20 to 25 hours minimum, you are saying. So, yes. and, and any per estimate week. on per week? And literally, it, it's so simple where you could cr imagine it was a board game, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, okay, your goal is to get 90 no's. Mm -hmm. right <laughs> <laughs> if you literally just played that game and obviously you should play it smartly so that mm -hmm. you know maybe after no number 10 and 20 and 30 mm -hmm. and 40 you're, you're reflective and you make adjustments to the pitch and all that kind of stuff but literally if you if you had that kind of determination you said okay my goal is to get 90 no's okay. um your your chances of, of successfully uh raising around are going to go up exponentially Okay. It really is. Um, it's that simple, but it's also that emotionally crushing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Completely understood. That it takes a lot of uh, courage to walk through all those nose, the nose corridor, corridor, and reach somewhere. Um, yeah. Any estimates or any ballparks on the length of time on average it takes to raise? or like six months, one year? Yeah, sure. At FI, really our focus, just because we work in the pre-seed, is gonna be on your your very first mm -hmm. or your second, you know, occasionally your third, but but for the most part, you know, we're gonna focus on that first or second round of funding. And the hardest thing um, with that funding is, is to get your lead investor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the lead investor is the one that really kind of stakes their claim and says, okay, like I'm, I'm going to lead this. I think there's value in this. Uh, and as a result of doing that, uh, it means two things. Number one, the, it's the hardest step to complete. Um, but number two, once you do complete that step, it, it really kind of greases the wheels and other people will come on board just because of the fact like, okay, well, this person, you know, is kind of putting a reputation on this and, and they're, they find this valuable. So in one of those first or second rounds of funding, it's going to be, yeah, it's four to six months. Um, and I think as, as you go further in the business and mm -hmm. you're aiming for more money, right? So as you start to get to further rounds and that kind of stuff, it becomes, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say then it's 20 to 25 hours a week for founders, but the timeline becomes much longer. Right. Where mm -hmm. a series A, a founder that's already at a series A or is about to run a, or about to raise a series A, mm -hmm. like the CEOs of those businesses, they never stop fundraising. Got like it. it's 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 a portion of their weekly, you know, maybe it's not 20 to 25 hours at that point, but it is a portion. Every single thing that they do is to unlock that next round of funding right because that's essentially the the path that they have outlined with the investors that have been in their latest round and getting to that next round of funding means two things number one mm -hmm. you know continuing to cultivate those relationships and doing kind of traditional fundraising and then number two actually getting the business to hit the metrics that mm -hmm. they need to hit to raise that next round of funding brilliant um so, so it's more like a constant drill. So it's a drill that is on and it's not going away anytime soon for a startup. Right. So that's a, that's a great learning here. Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I think I think there's two constant drills in any startup. Number one, okay. you're recruiting great people. And mm -hmm. number two, you're you're looking at that your burn, right? You're looking okay. at your, your runway, how much you have left. So 
you know, I, I think that's another point where it's like, look, if you're bringing in the cash mm -hmm. and your, your need for, you know, like that 20 to 25 hours maybe shouldn't be spent on necessarily raising funding. Maybe it should just be spent on getting that cash, right? It's all yeah. raising funding is a strategy to solve a problem. The problem is that you have, you might die yeah, <laughs> as yeah. a company, right? Exactly. And startups, of course, need to grow at a phenomenal pace. So that requires that injection would not be possible without funding. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it'll be an organic growth. So great points there. Uh, lessons for our community, recruitment and funding, that's not going away. Embrace it. It's going to take your time as a CEO. Um, um, let's go back. And I think as time goes yeah. on too, the, 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 the development to recruitment of great people goes up. Okay. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, of course. They become more important. It's the second tier team that's coming in, then the third tier team is coming in, and then there is hierarchy. You try to break away hierarchies, work like a single flow team. So great. Um, let's go back to that 80 million USD valuation. What happened after that? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, ultimately, we failed. Um, we were building this platform that was you know, enabling social features and online games, which at the time was like really interesting thing, right? We were leaderboards, you could challenge people, you can get points, all this kind of stuff. Again, this was before Facebook uh, had their gaming platform. So there wasn't really any central platform. And we were a SaaS company, essentially, we were licensing this to AOL, um, you know, and some other some other big organizations and then and then Facebook announced their platform and uh, you know the writing was kind of on the wall so um, you know we were at a point we we sold the business to two real networks and I saw somebody ask before the real player yes that's uh, old school um, <clears throat> real networks is a Seattle based organization so yeah we sold it you know it I wouldn't call it a, a successful exit um, at least in the the at least in the point that, you know, the investors in it, you know, they certainly didn't get anywhere close to the 10x that they wanted. I don't mm -hmm. think many of them technically lost money. Um, but uh, but still, it's they're not in the business to break even. They're not in the business to make 20%. They're in the business to make 100%, mm -hmm. right? So, so it was, yeah, and there was a lot of, uh, yeah, clipboards were being thrown, um, not... You know, there was like a Game of Thrones, just when the board trying to kick CEO off and mm -hmm, all, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. It was it got it got really dirty there at the end. Okay. And I think now all these NDAs, hopefully, I mean, this was 2008, have uh, expired, so I can say uh -huh. these things. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for the deep insight. When, how did, and when did Founder Institute come into play? Like, it was around close to 2010. So it's a direct result of, of the things that happened in that company. So <clears throat> as a result of, of just honestly the, the, the poor way we were being treated at the time, um, myself and Adeo, my co-founder and founder institute, uh, we, we launched a little website called thefunded.com. Mm -hmm. um, thefunded.com, it's still there. It's probably the ugliest website on the internet. So um i don't even Thanks. encourage you to go there we still have it running because it's it's still just a place where people can leave reviews but essentially the funded.com was a place where entrepreneurs uh could leave totally anonymous subpoena proof reviews of investors okay um like literally it's subpoena proof the way that we created the technology the spec was that once somebody was accepted they're assigned some random numbers so we got we got plenty of cease and desist orders trust me um and we were like hey here's the spec we, we don't know who they are sorry right um and the idea behind that site you know it wasn't supposed to be like vc bashing or anything like that because that that's not helpful for anybody because as I said before, any entrepreneur is going to hear no 90 out of 100 times, right? So if they go and then bash those VCs 90 times on some Yelp for VCs, that, that's not helpful for anybody. It's just the reality of the VC business. Um, so as part of that site, like we really only wanted people who were actively raising a round of funding to be providing those reviews. So literally, and this was 
you know, at the time it wasn't a huge site. We were really trying to trying to build this small community. We were hand reviewing every single person who was applying to join late VCs. And what we saw was a massive gap of people who said that they were about to raise a round of funding or were actively raising a round of funding, but had no were nowhere near the point of being able to do that. Right. Um, so we were rejecting them from the site. We were rejecting something like 80 to 85 percent of people from the site because it was somebody that was just like, hey, yeah, I just have this idea. I'm about to start pitching investors. Right. Or I am pitching investors already. And all I have is this business plan or something. Right. So it was essentially that gap um, that we saw between founders who thought they were ready for funding or who thought that funding was the next step in the evolution of their business. Um, that's where Founder Institute came in. And, and we the first iteration of Founder Institute was called the Funded Founder Institute, which was a handful, a mouthful. Um, and, you know, we even literally we were thinking about, oh, let's just create like a premium version of the Funded.com site, right, to handle the people that really need funding and all this kind of stuff. Um, but at that time, we were just throwing a lot of things against the wall and we're like, hey, like, let's just, let's try to start this like cohort based, you know, pre-seed accelerator kind of thing. And, and, you know, and it started in one classroom in Silicon Valley. And then let's just see how that goes. And then that uh, that's what ended up growing organically. But at the end of the day, the whole goal of it really was just to fill that gap of people who thought they were ready to raise funding, thought their next step was funding. Um, but we knew, like, no, you're like a hundred steps from that. Okay, um, and, and why the word institute? Just asking. The, it, was there a thought process? Was it that one classroom that you talked about? Um, I wish there was a good answer to that. So okay. you know, very. Uh, it, it literally was no. I mean, we, we were we were on GoDaddy looking at you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. I, I, I remember actually the, the literal story was uh, my co-founder day. I was talking to Michael Arrington and, and Michael Arrington, who was the uh, TechCrunch, right? And this was back when TechCrunch was just like a little blog. Uh, they were having a conversation and he told Michael Arrington what we were going to do. And Michael Arrington was like, okay, I'm going to write about this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we, we were literally on the clock. We're like, okay, we need to register a domain. We need to put up a website, blah, blah, blah. So we were like, okay, found our institute. That's available.com. Sweet register it right um so i wish there was a better uh no. you know strategic story but that was but, that but was in a point. retrospect it's also very unique uh the mix use unique it stands out uh from uh maybe shorter names of what so so so, so good to know uh that i'm and, glad we made a good decision under yeah. under the fire there <laughs> yes and and now you guys have grown phenomenally, uh, like uh, stats that you have over there, like more than 5,000 companies and more than 200 cities, 1.5 billion or more in funding raise. So, so that's, that's huge. What do you think is the reason behind this growth that happened in this period of 10 or 11 years? How, how, how? I think again, and maybe this, you know, I, we when we first started fi we had no intention of going global honestly okay, okay. Uh, we and it doesn't mean we didn't want to go global but it was like any and, and this is how honestly most entrepreneurs should think it's just like look to solve a problem for a customer if you do that well other opportunities will pop up and figure out where to go from there right so that first program we incorporated the business in april the first cohort started that was April 2009. The first cohort started in May of 2009. We got an unused classroom at Stanford University. We got a whole bunch of people together. We just started running a program. We were literally figuring out week three what the what it would look like on during week one of that program. Right. Um, by the end of that first program, um, we you know we we had gotten a bunch of press. Uh, great companies came out of that first cohort, even though we were sort of figuring things out as we went. Mm -hmm. Udemy, uh, one of our most successful companies, they just IPO'd a couple months ago. It's the world's largest source for online courses. They came out of that cohort. Um, and when we finished that cohort, we just, we had other people contacting us from other cities saying, hey, oh, yeah. I, it sounds really cool what you're doing. Can we bring it to our city? Um, so the second city that we went to was San Diego. 
and then we, we just grew organically from there. Um, I mean, we weren't like, Hey, let's go hire somebody in London or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, it was kind of a, like a ridiculously large period of time before we were in some of these, what people would call like the, the startup hubs, right. We were just mm -hmm. going by, by demand. I think our first, our first, uh, our first location in Europe was in Paris just because people reached out to us. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I, I remember back that we were in Afghanistan before we were in London. Okay. Right. Um, cause again, it was just all, it was all inbound. So, and, and I, I use that example because it's, you know, don't, um, for all like the dreaming that you can do and all this kind of stuff about world domination, it's just, just start by solving a problem for a customer and you do that well. Um, and your your different opportunities and pathways uh, will present themselves, and you can go in those directions. All right. To be honest, when we that first cohort, we hired like the most. You know, again, this was two thousand nine. We hired like super expensive video crews. They were they were mm -hmm. keeping every every session and stuff because we thought we were gonna like, you know, sell like the, these these like video courses or something. We were like, okay, maybe that's how we can make money, right? Like we had no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole, but at the end of the day, we're just like, let's do something that, that provides value and, and the opportunities just pop up. Excellent. Like very unique, very interesting to hear. And you use the word do a lot. Like, uh, uh, while you were talking, you used like five or six times, do let's move. So it's a lot of action, which I see. Yeah. And, and you said that start with a problem to solve, uh, start with it which means go do an action and then figure out your way that's how things started happening for you and if you're really doing a good job the inbound will start working for you so so that's that, that's great to hear where you are right now how do you see ecosystems right now there are different ecosystems like some are emerging ecosystems some are more up there on innovation some are branching out into specialized ecosystems like vertical based or certain things like that's a deep tech based impact focus stockholm for example is positioning itself we had mayor of stockholm here like we want to be the impact capital of the world so when you're sitting on the world table now with 200 cities where do you think ecosystems are different or similar or what you see challenges at ecosystem levels? So, first of all, I think that's really smart um, for for the Stockholm mayor to, 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 to say that. Hopefully they can back it up. <laughs> right. But I, I think it is. And even and I know the Nordics in general have just always been a good, I think, a good spot for that. Um, you know, one of our best companies up there out of Oslo, Total Control. Um, mm. They, it's it's a essentially a SaaS company that is helping large organizations reduce their food waste. Right. So yeah. for profit SaaS business, but it literally is helping us reduce food waste. Um, so I think it's really smart for for that for the mayor to to focus on that. I mean, I, I would say two things. If you want to look at the world in a traditional point of view, um, the fastest growing emerging markets right now are Latin and Africa, right? And a lot of that has simply been spurred by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin right now, the amount, you know, things just like e-commerce and SaaS and this kind of stuff are just absolutely exploding. Um, and what I like to tell people is just, you know, it's, it's similar to what we saw in Southeast Asia, maybe circa 2012, 2013 or so, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. what you'll see right now in Latam and Africa. But I think the bigger, the bigger point is that the, you know, like, let, let's just call this right now, right? This, a couple of years ago, what we're doing right now is called a webinar. Yeah. Right. Now it's called an event. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, you know, uh, uh, about a third of the people on the FI team, the FI headquarters team, I've never met in person. We have people coming through the Founder Institute now. They have co-founders they've never met in person, right? So honestly, the, the geographical barriers are being broken. Um, and as a result, and I think this is what you were alluding to, you, you know, the ecosystems are starting to be classified uh, obviously location will always be a classification but mm -hmm. now there's another cross-section where it, it's it's by vertical 
right? Or it's by industry or however yeah. you want to break it down because it's, it's not a barrier anymore. Um, and a lot of people that I speak to think it's sort of like a binary thing. It's like, oh, so you're saying that we're going to, uh, you know, just, just we're going to do all our business on Zoom from, from now forward. Like, no, that's not what we're saying. It's just that the virtual environment is going to be a massive part of the business mix moving forward. That trend has been accelerated by a decade. And especially for entrepreneurs uh, that, you know, are low, uh, have just low budget and, and things like that. If you're not mm -hmm. taking advantage of that um, and you're not utilizing that to recruit people um, and to recruit investors too, right? Because investors, it, this actually 2021 was the first year at least since like the dot bomb days where um, less than 30% of venture capital went to companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Right. So you're just seeing, and that similar uh, dynamic is happening all across the world, right? The uh, investors, because it's become so competitive because there's so many more investors coming into the market, everybody's looking for new market inefficiencies and just, yeah, uh, it, this has all been a very meandering way for me to say that the location is less and less of a barrier now, uh, not only for raising funding, uh, but also for recruiting people, for, for all of the different things that you need to do as a business. Okay. So it's, uh, the two major uh, like uh, areas that it has affected virtualization is funding and recruitment. Uh, and what do you think is the trend? Are investors also more open to just invest anywhere? Because many investors have country focused or region focused thesis. They have it somewhere like we will be doing this great thing in Nordics, for example, uh, which basically traps them into a market. It's good for positioning, but it traps them as well when virtualization happens or the pandemic happens. Yeah, um, I, I think it's always it's, it's again, it's not binary, right? Mm -hmm, I think it's like mm -hmm. virtual and physical. It's just moving in that direction, okay? right? And there's a lot of downward pressure. So you're seeing right now the, so let's talk about like the quote unquote, the real money, right? The trillions, the hundreds of billions. So we're talking mm -hmm. about like SoftBank, Tiger Global, yeah. uh, Global Sovereign Funds, all this kind of stuff. They are now moving into the VC space, Yeah. right? That is now, and the VC space, like any space, is a competitive space. So that is now forcing some traditional VCs, right? They're like, okay, well, you know, now my 50 million is not so impressive anymore, right? And I have to compete for that $50 million deal. So now um, the downward pressure on all the VC is moving earlier and earlier stage, okay? Great news for entrepreneurs, great news. Okay. Yes. Um, so not only is it moving earlier stage, right, but as, as a result of that same competitive pressure, uh, it's moving, you know, kind of uh, sideways, right? Or yeah. I would say, you know, geographically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, these are all amazing developments for early stage entrepreneurs uh, because, again, it's optionality is just, it, it's, it's the best thing you can have uh, as an entrepreneur. It's just options. Excellent. So I, I like the word like I, this is a great insight because we have had this in a couple of previous VC discussions that we have had on Startup Grind, like the downward pressure. We also think yep. there is an upward graduation happening like angels moving into VC space uh, yep. and launching. Like, is there some trend happening? Because you're also running uh, a sister company. How is it? It's uh, VC Lab. Yep. Maybe for our audience, you could clarify a little bit on that as well. And what kind sure. of so yeah, VC, VC Lab. VC Lab is a. It, it was a project we were running. Uh, now a lot mm -hmm. of our local leaders uh, for FI programs around the world, right? They're helping a ton of startups. A lot of them are angels. A lot of them are looking to to kind of put together their own funds. Um, so we started testing internally a program similar to FI, where it was mm -hmm. like just a, co a cohort based program to really keep you super focused and, and raise, uh, you know, your, your venture fund. Okay. And it, it's, it's, it literally just started as kind of like a perk for our, our local leaders. It was an internal project. And then again, it just, the demand 
was huge to the point where it's such a fundamentally different business from the Founder Institute, mm -hmm. just different audience that we spun it out into a, a sister company. So um, because uh, uh, to your point, all of that downward pressure is also creating a lot of opportunity for angels and for people that are super connected in these ecosystems mm -hmm. to essentially be scouts, right? Scout programs for VCs have been going on for years, um, but they're only expanding now because of all that downward pressure and essentially an angel who now raises their a, a, a larger fund to really be an angel at scale with not their own money, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, is essentially like a super scout except they're deploying their own money so yeah it's all of these things are really are really good developments for entrepreneurs because again it's just creating a ton of more opportunity um it's creating a ton of more options for you to either raise money and get advisors you know recruit other people to your team and again it's it's not so much constrained now uh by location okay got it got it Great points on uh, on the VC side. Let's come back to Founder Institute and a little bit on its more operational detailing for our uh, startup grind community here. Of, of course, uh, we are also running a fellowship, uh, wh which means that the community can uh, apply to the upcoming cohort, in, which is Sweden Virtual. What makes your program different, or how is like what's what's the key secret sauce? for the Founder Institute Pre-Seed Accelerator? So no, number one, we're super, super, super structured. Okay. Oh. Um, and by structured, I mean, literally, uh, and I, you know, I, I was on the event with you a week ago, mm -hmm. where the biggest startup killer for early stage startup is a lack of focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, at any given time as a startup, again, assuming you just you don't have a massive bank account where you could just keep bankrolling the company, your your biggest risk at any given time is just you have a certain runway and your time of your you know your your time of death is six months from now, or it's an eight months from now, or if it's 30 days from now, whatever it is. So every single day that you're focusing on the wrong things and not unlocking the next milestones in your business that are gonna get you to that next step is an, a, a one day closer to death. Okay. Right. So for us, it's we are incredibly structured to the to the point where in the FI program, every single week, we're giving you these growth sprints to complete your to, to continue building your business in a very structured fashion, telling you what to focus on and when. Right. Like, OK, yes. Is that a problem? Sure. But that's a problem you need to worry about in three weeks. Don't don't even think about it right now. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Like, that's the kind of thing that we do. And um you know the whole goal is just to have you really complete real life you know milestones in your business like talk mm -hmm. to this many customers this week close this many customers next week whatever it is uh to get you to really just kind of keep unlocking those new opportunities for your business um and then the, the second biggest thing i'll say is just is just the global nature of fi right okay. um we're in over 90 countries we have mm -hmm. uh investors advisors ecosystem leaders, founders in over 90 countries around the world. So, you know, as as we start to really realize this this truly global startup ecosystem, right, where people are co-foundering, you know, getting co-founders on other sides of the planet and this kind of mm -hmm. stuff, you know, I think uh, the FI network is 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 very, very unique in that aspect. And it's, it's something that from a technology perspective, we are uh, definitely doubling down on this year is to sort of unlock or what we're saying internally, unleash those opportunities mm -hmm. to, to create all of those nodes of connections across the network. And this kind of rhymes very well or fits very well with the virtualization that we are seeing happening. So the network approach or using the network that has been built over the last uh, 11 years or so. Um, and and start, but startup you, grind is great, by the way, yeah. too, for the, the same purposes, right? Startup grind has been around since I, I, it's is it earlier than 2009? It's got to be somewhere around there. I mean, yeah, it's somewhere around, around that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and honestly, all of these like I, I would encourage any entrepreneur who's at the early stages, like get involved with as many of these organizations as possible. Mm -hmm. OK, we, we ran this great event last week where who was there? I mean, Startup Grind was there. Antler yeah. was there. Um, you know, I don't know, Startup Weekend or the Tech Stars, right? All these different organizations. I think 
what a lot of people who start getting into startups don't realize is, is like, you know, um, none of these organizations is really trying to be like vertically integrated where they dominate mm -hmm, every mm -hmm. single point of it in startups. And, you know, I guess you could call it quote unquote innovation, although it's still kind of a cloudy word to me. It, it's optionalities is the best thing you can have, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about competition. Um, like founder Institute doesn't compete with startup grind. We don't compete with Antler or any of these other organizations. It's all about just widening and growing that pool. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we're not all trying to, you know, break off your leg to, to get another 1% of a, of a defined 100% pie. Right. We're mm -hmm. trying to turn that 100% into a thousand percent collectively. Right. And um, yeah, get involved with as many of these different organizations as you can. Uh, there's a lot of different offerings out there mm. and um, you know, a lot of them are, are good fits for people and a lot of them aren't good fits for other like we have a lot of entrepreneurs that come to fi and honestly they're just too far along for us okay and we, and we tell them hey no you should go go apply to tech stars like you're you're okay you know you're too far for us um so i i would uh yeah for anyone on here get involved and especially now with all of the virtualization you know you don't have to physically uh go to a venue to uh to attend an event like this you could just fire it up on your on your browser exactly brilliant uh, if we go back to your points on um on the program itself um, you, me you mentioned two major points one was structure and i wrote it here like weekly sprints like uh, so for our audience who are planning to join this program so what you're saying it's a very it's less theoretical and more applied and more tough the program itself how would you in feeling like two three words describe this Yes, it's very, it's, it's certainly not theoretical. We're not a school. Okay. Um, and to your point, you know, our discussion before, maybe institute wasn't the best word we chose, but, you know, mm. <laughs> again, there wasn't any great, uh, great meeting of the minds around that. But, you know, we're, we're not a school. You're not going to learn how to be an entrepreneur. You're, you're going to build mm. your business. Build. Right. Yes. So none of it, when, when people say, oh, I didn't complete the homework, it just it literally makes me cringe. I'm like, no, it's not homework. Mm. Like, no, like you're not building your business. You're not meeting the growth metrics that you need to meet in the business, mm -hmm. right? So every single week in FI, you have growth sprints to actually build your business, okay? So we're making sure that you're moving quickly. Um, and then uh, secondly, you're getting ratings, ratings and reviews from your local leaders and the mentors in the program. Okay. Right? So we're making sure that you're not just moving fast, but that uh, you know this this meeting of the minds of people in your local market are also rating you and saying okay they're making good decisions strategy makes sense all this kind of stuff right so it's speed and like validating it against local mentors to make sure that that speed is not you know <laughs> moving quickly and making really bad decisions it's moving yeah. quickly and, and making okay like this seems okay so that that's that's really the the model of it where um you know it's not about learning how to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. it's learning mm -hmm. by doing um it's actually building out the business and if you don't complete the sprints and if you get are getting bad ratings from the mentors and the leaders then you're given what we call a, an epic sprint uh, uh -huh. which is you know kind of a, a diagnosis and a, and a special sprint to see okay look uh the investors are, are the mentors and the leaders are telling us that your value proposition makes no sense or that you're not mm. going to have any reasonable way to reach customers or whatever. Right. So we give you a, an epic sprint to fix that specific problem. And if you're able to complete that epic sprint, you continue in the program. And if not, you're asked to leave. Okay. Right. Um, so this is, yeah, it's, uh, it's intense the program for sure. And uh, it's, it's hard because uh, building a business is really hard. So, um, mm -hmm. FI is hard, but building a great business, uh, is much, much harder. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, let's start taking, so I'm seeing a couple of questions popping up here. Sukul, maybe you can also, uh, uh, summarize and send me over the questions. I've received two or three directly. Uh, one, what makes one idea succeed and another fail? 
like is there a dividing line between success and failure like what makes a startup click or grow or glow very fast if i understand from it well i would i would actually rephrase the question where it's it's not um the idea is not super relevant okay um, to, to be honest at least in the early stages the idea is the seed um it's the execution and evolution of that idea over time you'll you'll be very hard pressed to find a a you know mature company with tons of employees and revenue and all this stuff where the exact business that they're running now is was that same you know proverbial light bulb uh that came up in the in the founder's head when they when they conceived of the business right so um i think from an idea perspective I would say that good ideas are super focused and they solve a problem for a specific customer. Um, bad ideas are super unfocused and try to solve very unwieldy ideas for multiple customers. Um, and then outside of that, all of the value in the business is created in the evolution of that original idea to how it actually uh, is solving the problem for a customer in the market okay. and, a, and a problem that a customer is willing to pay to solve. Okay. Right. So it's not a, uh, it's not a trivial, a trivial problem. Okay. Got it. Uh, how, next question, how important is customer feedback and how should you collect it in early stage startups? Uh, it's the most important thing. It's, okay. Uh, Short answer. I would, okay. Yeah. As a as a so let's say you're a uh, a comp, you know you're an entrepreneur and and you haven't even started building any any uh, product yet. Like I, don't even call yourself a founder. Like you're like a you're a researcher. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. And not only are you a researcher, but the problem that a lot of people have is and and this is something we we say a lot in the Founder Institute is like don't fall in love with your idea. Okay. Okay. Because being a researcher is hard, right? Researchers are trained through years of university to be unbiased and to ask questions that don't specifically lead their subjects to an answer that they are, you know, unconsciously crafting in their head, right? And so that's a big issue with founders where, yeah, you know what, if you ask your mom, if she thinks you have a great idea, she's mm -hmm. going to say, oh, it's the greatest idea in the world, follow your dreams, right? So, um, being able to, yes, you, you, you are essentially the chief research officer of not even a company of just your little project in your head mm. and your entire, like, we actually say that you should flip it across. It's like, don't try to validate your idea, which is how most people will go into it. Okay. Right. And, and, and because when you try to validate your idea, you'll ask questions that just unconsciously lead the subject of your questions to, uh, to the result that, that you subconsciously have, okay. right? You actually want to try to kill your idea. So take the absolute opposite approach, right? Uh -huh. And the other thing is, is that when you are speaking to customers in those early stages, if you talk about your solution at all, you've already failed, okay? At that point, all you're trying to do is understand a customer problem and every single thing that you need to know about that problem. What words do they use to, to clarify that problem? The words that you're using are probably very different than the words that they're using. How big of a problem is it? How do they solve the problem now? Do they solve it at all? Do they even care, right? Like all of those interviews, all of that customer feedback should just be diving into the problem. Um, you should not introduce your solution or your mm -hmm. ideas on how to solve that problem at all. And once you start to do that, that's where, uh, yeah, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, confirmation bias in startups. Um, and I think that's kind of the tricky thing with customer development and, and interviewing customers is being able to do that in, in, a, in a truly objective way. Now, this is great thing that you're saying. And I think this is great insight for the community, wherever they are, irrespective of where, whether they are in Stockholm or some other city. Like, don't go out with a pre-configured mold go and configure uh, what you want to develop around what you hear or validate the problem with your research don't mm -hmm. validate your idea validate okay. the problem and if there's not a if the problem isn't there and if you can't understand that the terminology that the customer uses and really fully understand that problem then 
um, you're already starting off on a, on a really bad footing when you're when you're building out the business. Okay, got it. A very specific question from uh, Eric here. Let's see if we can get an answer from you on that. Should you ask all existing angels if any of them wants to lead the next round, 14 angels, or should I actively ask a special agent and then go one by one instead if they decline? Okay. Interesting question. Um, <laughs> I like I like how you're thinking about it though because you have to be very strategic. So let me let me bring up an example, okay? So in so we have a program called Funding Lab. So after you go through the FI core program, if you graduate, then you have all of these other post programs that are totally free for alumni um, to help you continue to build out the business, right? So Funding Lab in particular is one of those programs, and that program is designed to help you get the lead investor on your next round of funding. Mm -hmm. And at least in that program, literally, so this kind of also gives insight into the level of, of detail that we have in our in our growth sprints. Um, we have you build out a target list of investors, and then we have you rank the investors by priority, and we have you start pitching, quote unquote, the, the ones at the bottom of that list first. Okay. <laughs> right? Like you want to test the pitch, get the feedback, all that kind of stuff, not on the, the ones that you really want to close, right? But on other ones, because again, it's all about feedback. It's customer development. It's the same thing, right? Your customers, your investors. So I guess in, in this case, you know, you're saying that you have eight, 17 angels. Is that what you said? 18 14, angels? 14. Okay. okay. All right. Um, that's, that's a big group of angels. Uh, what I, what I would recommend is, Maybe I wouldn't go what I said before in terms of starting at the bottom because because they may actually say yes <laughs> mm. because they already they already invested in your business so there is some level of validation there. I, I I honestly would the goal of finding a lead investor is because that lead investor is going to help you fill out the rest of the round, right? They're they're almost like your co-pilot, mm. so to speak, on the round. So uh, it has to be somebody that, that doesn't just have a checkbook. All of your 14 angels have checkbooks, right? It has to be somebody that then um, has the other, the other network, their friends that can help fill out the round, you know, their background, that kind of stuff. So I would validate it that way. Um, if I were you, 14 angels, maybe I'd, I'd break it down and to say, okay, well, here are the five that I think if they were a lead investor in my next round, that can really help me fill out this round and make it successful, right? So now you've got 14 to five. And then mm -hmm. from that five, maybe then I would start with number five and then go five, four, three, two, one, up the chain. Okay. okay. That's now, again, I, I don't, you, you know, don't, uh, I don't have all the information on the relationships <laughs> and stuff, but that, that at least from an objective point of view, I would take a, a somewhat of a strategy mm -hmm. to that. Okay, excellent. Uh, we'll take one or two more questions. We have Joseph. He, uh, if I read the question right, does FI invest directly in startups? Do you have an investment no. vehicle or, okay, so you don't invest directly? No, we don't invest directly in startups. Uh, what we do with the VC lab program that we talked about before mm -hmm. is, um, you know, we're, we're creating these other funds and, and other angels and VCs that are alongside the startups that we build in FI. Um, FI exists to help you build a fundable global startup. And then obviously with all of the, we have over 25,000 mentors in the FI program mm -hmm. around the world. A lot of those mentors are angels, right? Working with companies at this pre-seed stage. So um, something about 20, 15 or 20 percent or so of the mentors that we have in FI are angel investors. Um, and we are, you know, we have great relationships with a lot of accelerators like mm -hmm. Techstars. We refer a ton of companies to Techstars, for example. Right. Um, and uh, through the VC Lab program, we are building out this massive network of, of investors ready to fund our companies. And in total, our companies have raised like, on the site. It says 1.5. We had a big round last okay. week so now now it's it's approaching two billion dollars of funding um mm -hmm. for all of our for all of our companies around the world 
Excellent. I think we are hitting the end point on the event or webinar or yeah, whatever we may event. call it in the event. Yes. <laughs> but get uh, together. Uh, yes, get together. Uh, the meetup, get together event. So I think uh, that, that's great. Uh, but Jonathan, uh, a big thank you from the Startup Grind Stockholm community, from the greater Stockholm community of startups for making time for us and uh, sharing your interesting thoughts over here and very practical points. So a lot of practical points for startups and founders and innovators out there on how to build their venture. And don't forget the community out there. We, uh, there is a fellowship. You can, uh, Sukul, my colleague, has put down the link over here. If you have any more questions about it, you can reach out to Startup Grind. You can reach out to Founders Institute. Thank you so much for being here today. And Jonathan, have a me. very, very good. We have, a, have a very, very good start to the day. Here it is evening now. Yeah. 8, 8 a.m. here. Yep, I'm ready to get going. Now, now I'm okay. properly. I may, I may be over, over caffeinated at this point, but okay. thanks for having me, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.